Okay, so House of the Dragon Episode 3 is now out, and the episode is filled with Easter eggs, lots of plot points that pull from the books, and an ending that sets up some major things for the future. Throughout this video, we're going to be breaking it all down, and as always, make sure you're subscribed as we're going to be covering the show every single week. Now, this episode gives us a time jump of three years that sees a new character coming into the fold who we'll talk about more in just a bit. When we last left them, Damon and Corlys Valerian had just formed a pact in order to stop Crab Feeder and his crappy forces. This union is symbolised in the opening shot, which shows his banner of the seahorse along with the embers of fire representing House Targaryen. We see that one of Corlys' ships is being burned by Crab Feeder's forces, and this metaphorically shows how much they're destroying his fleet. Corlys in the book was said to have amassed the biggest navy in the world, and his shipping realms allowed him to gain more money than the Lannisters. Though Crab Feeder initially just started ransacking pirates, this eventually moved to the bigger ships and he tortured the crews like what we see here. He hammered nails through their hands similar to a crucifixion and let the crabs feed on his victims before the tide rolled in and they all drowned. This opening is so powerful and we hear the high-pitched whistle of Caraxes before the dragon rolls in and destroys everything. Poor lad, he thought he was going to get saved, but the man gets smashed like that like button, eh? See ya chump. Now we can't really show most of this as I don't want to get it demonetized, eh, demonetized, but Crab Feeder ends up hiding in the caves, which forces Damon to get his hands dirty and go in there later. Now arrows rain down which makes Damon leave, and it's likely that several attacks like this have happened, with the dragon having to flee due to the bombardment from the sky. Now as always, we're not really going to be giving away any major spoilers such as the twists or deaths, but we will be talking about certain things from the books to give things more context. This includes stuff like who Alicent's unborn baby is, the thing that Viz does that leads to more issues with Rhaenyra, and a couple of bits in here, but nothing too crazy. If you don't want, to, if you don't want to know anything, yeah, it's off. Now I also feel like there's some major differences here from the source material that are worth going over, so you understand why things have played out the way that they did. Anyway, building off last week, the book actually saw the allegiances between Daemon and Corlys come with a title. Damon was announced as being King of the Stepstones, which this episode doesn't really touch upon. I'm also guessing that they changed things up with Myseria, as she isn't in the episode, and also due to the time jump that we had, there, there seems to be a lot of different things going on. Now in the book, the events from last week played out similar to how they did in the episode, with Viserys demanding that Damon return to his wife. Damon announced that Myseria was pregnant, but unlike the episode, she actually was. However, when the king said that Damon had to break off the marriage, he sent her away and she ended up losing the baby. He then formed the union with Corlys, but he held a grudge against his brother because of the death of his child. Aegon was later born which pushed him further down the line, but it looks like they're changing things up with Miseria's baby just being a lie. Now in the show it never existed, and as many of you pointed out in our last breakdown, she actually hinted that she made sure that she couldn't have children. So they are kind of keeping things in line with the book and having the baby never being born, but depending on whether it actually existed or not, depends on what canon you subscribe to. Make sure you subscribe as well. Now we cut to Aegon's birthday and see that Otto has a couple more grey hairs and Alicent has another one on the way. Also, nice little detail, but I think they might have moved Viserys' hairline back a bit, showing how he's gotten slightly older as well. In the book when he was older, he was depicted as being bald, so this is keeping in line with how things develop in the source material. And that's why this video is sponsored by Keeps. Just kidding, it's, it's not. Now this episode shows where the fractures really start to form in the family, as Rhaenyra knows she'll be looked over in favour of Aegon. Most of the crowd think he's the next in line, and we even get lines like this. Two years old and already our boy has a kingly presence. Well I think he's a chump mate. Now even Otto gets pressure put on him to get the king to announce that he's the new heir, but he likely sees the danger that this could put his grandson in, so he decides not to push it. There's also the talk of war with a Lannister popping up, but what I think is the first time in the series. You can see the house banner on his chest, which contains a golden lion on it, and this is Tyland, who we meet before his brother Jason later on. The pair are twins, with Tyland being the elder, but they're both played by Jefferson Hall. Now they become pivotal characters later on when we get to the Dance of the Dragons. This is basically a term used to describe the civil war that eventually comes to take place. The book also talks about his brother Jason's failure to secure Rhaenyra's hand, which we see playing out in the episode. Now the Lannisters at this point were of course quite far down the chain in terms of houses, and it would be a long time before they built themselves up to become the dominant house that we see in the main series. Jaime Lannister would later go on to kill Aerys Targaryen, which ended up propping a Baratheon up on the throne, and I loved seeing how the family were almost married here. 
And this video is sponsored by Established Titles, a gift that lets you become like your favourite characters in House of the Dragon. Did you know there's a traditional custom in Scotland where if you own a piece of land, you can refer to yourself as a lord, laird or a lady. That's why I was super interested in this project, which allows you to get at least one square foot of dedicated land on a private estate in Edelston, Scotland. So if you pick up a plot, you can refer to yourself as a lord whilst also helping to preserve the picturesque woodlands that exist there. It's also a great way to help out the environment as established titles will plant one tree for every single purchase. They work with global charities like One Tree Planet and Trees for the Future to help out with reforestation efforts. And there also comes a bit of an ego boost on top of all the environmental stuff. You, yes you, you can officially change your name on things like plane tickets, credit cards, add a little lord in front of it, you'll look bloody classy. They also give you an official certificate confirming your lordship and this also contains your unique plot number with the exact location of your land. Bow before me punk, I am Lord Kevin Spoilers, ruler of this realm of spoilerdom. Now on top of this, established titles have told me that the first 200 people to use my link below, you'll be placed in a plot within walking distance of mine and we can be best mates. Depending on how many of you want to become a lord or a lady, it just means we can build our heavy spoilers kingdom together and be there forever, close to each other. A Labor Day is right around the corner and established titles have put together a sale where you can claim 10% off any purchase. I've linked it in the description below when all you have to do is go to establishedtitles.com slash heavy spoilers and enter heavy spoilers at the checkout to get that 10% off. That's establishedtitles.com slash heavy spoilers enter heavy spoilers at the checkout and get yourself 10% off. It makes a great last minute gift, it helps the environment and it's also just a bit of fun. I bid thee farewell fellow lord, I shall see thee in the rest of the video. Take care, farewell. Now we cut to Rhaenyra under the weirwood tree that we saw in episode 1. The carvings on these were created by the children of the forest and eventually when they were pushed north, the men who invaded the land ended up worshipping them. Several episodes in the original series had them bowing and taking oaths before these trees and they were supposed to represent the gods of the forest. Here due to all the cushions, we see how Ray pretty much uses it as a place to hang out and read and she of course did this in the first episode on the knees of Alicent. However, she wasn't too interested in the traditions back then whereas here she's engrossed in the book showing how much her mindset has changed. The friendship isn't what it used to be and with her dad taking a new wife and having a new family, she's very much become pushed out. Now the books kind of depicted Alison as being someone who was hungry to have Aegon sitting on the throne, but here she does try to extend an olive branch to Rhaenyra. We likely see how this constant rebuffing causes issues down the line, and the pair end up splitting into separate sides as we get further into the story. Cut of the family riding out of the royal hunt, which will mark Aegon's second birthday. We can catch him in the carriage, and here we see him playing with a model of the black dread Dragon Balerion. This was for Cerys's dragon, and not only did he have a model of it last week, but we saw a statue of it in the square during episode 1. Viz was really fond of it, and he kept its skull beneath the keep, which we also visited in that same entry. Now we don't know what dragon egg was placed in Egon's crib, but I hope he doesn't get egg on his face when he sees the tension he's born into. Oh, mm. Now Alison is also pregnant with another child, who we know from the books ends up being called Helena. One of the main issues that arises between the pair has seed sown in this entry as Viz refuses to remove Rhaenyra as the heir even though Alicent keeps popping out these kids. She was of course pushed into getting close to Viz by her father in the hopes that the pair would have children together and one would end up sitting on the throne. Viz desperately wants Rhaenyra to have a child too but knowing what happened with her mother you can see why she's not too thrilled at the idea. The child would also be born into a time where every heir is being looked at and scrutinised and this would put it into direct conflict with Alicent's offspring. Now at this point, we hear a nod to Aegon the Conqueror. I'll hail Aegon the Conqueror, babe, second of his name. This lad's obviously not done much conquering though, but this is a nod to an ancestor of his. Aegon the Conqueror was the first Targaryen king, and he took over six of the seven kingdoms. Later on at the campfire, Viserys also says how he had a dream in which his son wore the Conqueror's crown. This vision pushed him to obsess over having a son, and it very much led to Emma's death. Now the crown actually appears in the title sequence and we open with a sigil of dragons representing Old Valyria. This city ended up falling and the crown then remains behind showing Aegon's rise. Also they keep saying Aegon, I've always thought it was Aegon 
but I will be following the pronunciation in the series and just saying egg on, even if it doesn't sound as cool, because it just reminds you of a big egg. And whilst he's paraded out front and cheered for, Rhaenyra sits behind in the chariot. No one really wants her there, and they're all more bothered by the male heir, who everyone thinks should oust her. Now at this point we meet Laris Strong, whose nickname Laris Clubfoot due to one of his feet twisting at birth. Him sitting with the ladies because he's not good at hunting actually has a great second side to it that we learn more about in the source material. Now though it seems like he's just resting up, it's actually laying the groundwork for him to become the master of whispers, which is a role that he got in the books. Laris in the source material is described as being someone who tends just to listen rather than speaking, and we see that very subtly playing out here. Lady Kira then starts asking lots of dumb questions about Damon, even though Rhaenyra hasn't seen him since the bridge. It's clear that the women know things have devolved into war, even if the crown isn't officially in the conflict. Now outside, Rhaenyra meets Jason Lannister. He brings up Casterly Rock and also the wall, which you'll likely know from the main series. He lays it on Factor 50 thick, Rhaenyra runs off, and maybe mate, you'd have better luck with your sisters. Now Viserys gets angry over this too, and he has a blowout at the wedding, saying that even he doesn't exist above tradition. He was kind of forced into his marriage with Alicent, and in some ways he wasn't really over Emma, but the council said that he had to secure the realm. There's still a lot of talk about how he should have married in with the Valerians, which his council once more tells him to. Now this massively ties in with the book, and one of the main reasons that he keeps Rhaenyra as the heir here is because he viewed the whole Alicent thing as being a way to secure the realm. He was also advised by others not to marry her, so he's just sticking with the original plan because he wants to keep the peace. Now one of Viserys' big character flaws is that he tried to live up to the legacy left behind by Jaehaerys. Because he ruled over a time of peace and tranquility, Viz doesn't want to cause any conflict, so he basically just becomes a people pleaser. Rey ends up riding away from the party, and at this point she's pursued by Kristen Cole. Now, I might have been watching a bit too much Westworld, but I found it interesting that their horses are black and white, showing how they are somewhat opposites, and a opposites attract. Ter terrible easter egg that. Now she's annoyed that her dad just sees her as being someone who could raise up the Lord of Castle Rock, but as we know, the Lannisters do end up on the throne come the main series. Bit of sexual tension here between Kristen and Rhaenyra as the pair go through the woods, and he of course asks for her favour during the tourney in the first episode. We also learn his father was at Blackhaven, which was a castle in the Dornish Marches. Now from here we cut to the hunt, which is something that saw the end of Robert Baratheon. He was skewed by a wild boar, and hey, if you want to see the biggest boar in Robert Baratheon's life, meet his good friend Ned Stark. I said his good friend Ned Stark, a bloody boar, I'm here all week. Now a boar ends up popping up in the entry, and we also hear mention of a certain coloured stag. What's a stag like? He's white. He's, he's white? What do you think, Jax Arcana? He's white. Now in Westeros, white stags were seen as being good omens. However, the one Viserys comes face to face with isn't white at all, and he fails to give the killing blow first strike. Very symbolic here as it shows how he's losing his edge, and that the future isn't with him. However, who it does appear in front of is Rhaenyra. Referred to as the White Heart, this was the symbol of royalty before the dragons were used, and to me it shows that she's the true heir. Now from here we see as Jason presents the king with a spear forged in the Golden Gallery. This was located within Casterly Rock, and it contained all manner of items from bowls, plates, to swords, and also spears. Now there were even golden teeth made there, and this is a personal gift from the Lannisters. You also get a good look at the Valerian steel dagger, which Viserys still carries with him. This of course appeared throughout Game of Thrones, and it was the weapon that ended up being used to kill the Night King. Viz gripped it tightly when delivering the speech at the end of episode 1, and I love that we see it constantly popping up with him. Now Jason asks for Rhaenyra's hand in marriage again, and he says that he'd make up for her loss in station. Everyone is assuming that Aegon is going to be king, and Viserys starts to get paranoid that there might even be a rebellion at some point. This comes to fruition as well, with there eventually being two factions created called the Greens and Blacks. Now I started getting even bigger nonce vibes than last week when Otto suggests that Rhaenyra marries her two-year-old stepbrother instead of Jason Lannister. It's pretty messed up, uh, but Otto was a very wise man and he could see that the war was coming between the two sides. He knew that it would fracture the houses right down the middle with some thinking that Rhaenyra should be queen, as they already swore their loyalty to her in episode 1. However, others would want a male heir above all else, so Otto is just trying to stop this from happening. But yeah nonce. 
it was actually commonplace in the Targaryens for them to marry their brothers, sisters, uncles, aunties, nephews and nieces, and hey, maybe that Jon Snow and Danny scene could end up getting referenced at some point down the line. We get more shots here of Viz looking unhinged, and it very much echoes the insanity that would come with the Mad King. The Targaryens insisted that keeping it in the family was the best way to go about it, but we know from science that this causes numerous genetic issues. Every time there's interbreeding, all the faulty genes end up being carried across, and because there's not someone without them to negate them from another family, these genes end up getting more dominant. Now, this was the case in real life with the German royal family, who all did the same thing. It eventually led to something called the Habsburg jaw, which made their chins look like Jimmy Hill after he'd had a hard night of E. So all these factors eventually play into the Mad King being born, which causes the house to be ousted from the throne. Now at this point it's suggested that Rhaenyra marry in with the Valerians for the reasons that were suggested last time, and also because it would take away the diss that Viz did by turning his daughter away. So Lainor is mentioned as fighting in the Stepstones, and we eventually meet him later on during the conflict. Now out in the woods, the little cosy campfire is interrupted, with Rhaenyra getting the best offer for something on top of her that she's had all day. Kristen saves her life, and the pair grow even closer than before, which might lead to some trouble down the line. Now in front of the fire, Viserys tells Alicent that he named the heir out of love. I love the way how Alicent calls him, Congrats. and it shows that it's very much ceremony, though I know people kind of view their relationship a bit differently. I have my own opinions on it, but yeah, let me know how you interpreted this line. Now back at the keep, Otto meets with his daughter. Gonna have to crop out all this edit, and if you go if you go back and look at this scene, there's a mural on the wall there where there's four people banging. Can't show it, mate, but it's a gangbang, and go back and look, because it is pretty funny. Anyway, Alison is aware that Aegon is gonna cause issues with Rhaenyra, and Otto talks about how unpopular Viserys will be if he doesn't announce him as the new heir. The laws of God and men at the time dictated that men should rule, and I love how reluctant that Alicent is. It's very much just her father once more pushing her to go and convince him to make a new announcement, and it's all Otto just manipulating things behind the scenes. Now one detail that you might notice here is that Viserys is missing two fingers. As we saw last week, his little one was infected, and this clearly spread to his other. Throughout the majority of the entry, he wears gloves, but we finally see that two are gone. In episode 1, he stated that the cut on his back was caused by the throne, and we also saw as he ended up slicing his little finger after he sent Damon away. In the book, George R. R. Martin described how you had to sit on the throne in a certain way in order to avoid getting cut. If you were cut whilst you were on it, it showed you were not fit to rule, symbolising why Viserys was a bad leader. But I think he's alright. Now, I doubt the throne ever gets cleaned as well, and it is possible that this could be tetanus or something else. Though we initially thought it was grayscale, it's gone on for too long now, and a lot of you had other theories about what it could be. This included diabetes and other diseases that he might have picked up from just the hygiene and diet at the time. Either way, I love how the throne is constantly causing Viserys to rot from the inside, showing that he's not really fit to sit on the throne. They never mention any of this in the book, so it is difficult to fully nail down what it is, so let me know your thoughts below on what you think's going on. Now it turns out that Vaiman Valerian has reached out for help, but Viserys doesn't want to rock the boat by sending aid, as it will show he supports people who initially went against him. He believes this will cement that he's weak, and he's very much just in a catch-22 situation where he's constantly making people angry by trying to please others. We do get a shot of the letter, and I've paused it for you, so you can see that it talks about asking for swords and also healthy soldiers. Now Viserys' reply later gets read out loud, and we too meet Vaiman, who is the brother of Corlys. He realises that killing crab feeder is better for the realm, and thus he sends in some help. However, Damon would rather just do it himself, and he even ends up shooting the messenger upon receiving word from his brother. Well, not shooting, but, sm but smashing him. Like, you should smash that and that, like, but never mind. Now, whereas my dad used to constantly say, never get married, Viserys is still banging on about it. However, this time he allows Rhaenyra to find her own match, and he also promises that she won't be supplanted. However, he is very much the one who's keeping that in check, and it's going to be interesting to see if the circumstances change. Now from here we cut to the Stepstones, and I love this slow pull back from the battle to the forces gathered on another island. Set such an atmosphere seeing the ship slowly roll in, whilst the dragon swarms the sky. There's also a bit of foreshadowing that sets up what's to come. The crab feeder and his men have no reason to leave those caves. We must give them one. Now Damon decides to use himself as bait to draw Crabfeeder's forces out the caves. 
He doesn't want his brother's help, as it's somewhat of a humiliation to him that he would need others to come to his aid, and thus he rides out on his own. It leads to a massive action scene, and this reminded me a lot of the Battle of the Bastards. Just in the same way that Jon Snow rushed ahead, we get the same thing with Daemon too. We even have similar shots where we see the pair from behind echoing this final charge. I was kind of gutted that Damon turned Kragus into Krabby Patty this early on, and after thinking he might be a big antagonist, he gets cut down pretty quickly. Now his death differs from how it's in the source material, and in that he was beheaded, whereas here he's cleaved in two. I think it's way more impactful, as I'm kind of desensitised to beheadings at this point, and watching Damon drag him along like a suitcase is an image I think will stick in everyone's minds for a while. Now you do have to kind of suspend your sense of disbelief here, as I feel like Damon is a bit like Vamp from Metal Gear Solid 2 when it comes to arrows. Hundreds are fired at him throughout the battle without most of them hitting him, though they do eventually get a couple of hits in. Now there's a nice bit of detail here on his armour as he kneels down, and you can see where the arrow hit him from earlier in the episode. Now, these arrows raining down also share some similarities to the Battle of the Bastards, and overall it makes for a really thrilling action scene. You see how merciless and brutal that Daemon is, and you start to understand why the council was so worried about him becoming king. He's obsessed with bloodshed, and bearing dragons also makes him a very fearsome warrior. Now, whereas Crabfeeder's look has changed up from the source material, his soldiers aren't. The clothes and armor that these wear actually look a lot like how Crabfeeder is depicted in the book, and they all rush Daemon. Hope seems lost, but this was all part of the plan, with it being a way to draw out Crabbeater's forces so that the Valerian army and dragon could strike at once. At this point, Lainor rides in on his white dragon, which we know from the source material is called Sea Smoke. The beast completely demolishes the archers, and after Crabbeater flees into his cave, Damon goes in after him. It's a great way to end the episode, and this was again another really enjoyable entry. We've had three weeks now where I've been gripped by the show. And at the moment, this is my favourite thing on TV. It's so well written, shot and paced that I can't not admire what they've done with the series. I thought I was out after season 8, but this has pulled me right back in. And those some other bitches, they've done it again. Three really solid episodes, and I also hope that you've been enjoying the breakdown so far. Obviously, let me know if you think they're great. If you think they're crap, I don't mind reading that either. Drop your thoughts on the breakdown. Drop your thoughts on the episode. Drop your thoughts on the book. Let's all have a look. Anyway, we are running a competition. <laughs> Such a crap brain that. I don't know why I thought that was clever. But yeah, we're running a competition right now and giving away three copies of Top Gun Maverick on the 15th of September. And all you have to do to be on the chance of winning is like the video, make sure you subscribe and the notifications on, and drop a comment below with your thoughts on the episode. We pick the comments at random at the end of the month, and the winners of the last one are on screen right now. So if that's you, then message me on Twitter at Heavy Spoilers. If you want something else to watch, then make sure you check out our breakdown of Lord of the Rings, which will be linked on screen right now. We go over all the stuff you need to know about that too, so get, get over there. Why the hell aren't you there? Anyway, with that out of the way, thanks for watching through this. Hope you enjoy yourself, and I'll see you in the next one. Take care. Peace.